Hey, good morning, everybody. Thanks very much for joining us today. It's been a, a couple of months at least since we've uh, had to have one of these briefings. We, we like to do this for particularly for our partners in the media. You, you guys do a great job getting good information out uh, to the public, and, and so this is really designed for you all to answer your questions and, and try to give you as much information as we can. Um, I, I did w just want to start here in the new year just remembering two groups. For, uh, remember our health care workers. Uh, remember the people who are our frontline workers in hospitals and clinics and doctor's offices, our uh, EMS people, people who are working every day uh, trying to control uh, this epidemic, the people who work in public health, the people in this building, the people who are working in our county health departments, people all over the state who are now about to begin their third year uh, of doing this work. We're just are really grateful for them and appreciate them. Um, that the second group I'd like you to remember are the, the 9,310 Alabamians we lost this past year uh, as we begin the new year. Um, we now have lost uh, 16,496 uh, Alabamians to this disease since the beginning, including 41 deaths that were reported to us yesterday. So we uh, unfortunately are not in a, a real good place right now. We are seeing the highest daily case numbers that we have seen since the pandemic began. Um, over the past seven days, we've had uh, numbers in the range of uh, 8,000, 8,000, 7,000, 5,000, 4,000, 7,000 more yesterday. Um, several of those are actually records uh, compared to what we were, have seen before last week. Uh, so these numbers are, are higher than we have ever seen before. All counties uh, in the state of Alabama are in the red zone, in the highest uh, level of transmission uh, category. Uh, our percent positivity rates is almost 39%, uh, almost four out of every 10 uh, tests that are being done are returning to us as positive. Uh, re remember that we actually have no visibility on home antigen tests that people are doing. Those don't get reported to us, so undoubtedly there are a lot of tests out there being done, many of them probably positive that we actually don't even know about. Uh, so we tend to think we're undercounting the number of cases that we've seen. Uh, the Really the take home point from what's going on right now is that, that the Omicron variant that is becoming the predominant variant in this country is incredibly contagious. It is much more contagious than the Delta variant. It is many times more contagious than anything we have seen before. Uh, many orders of magnitude more contagious than the original strain that we had two years ago, almost, uh, almost two years ago. Uh, and it is just spreading like wildfire. Uh, it uh, will infect uh, everyone in this state at some point, probably, uh, or, or most of them. Uh, so we really need people to do the single most important thing they can do to protect themselves, which is to be fully vaccinated and boosted when it's appropriate to do that. Uh, being fully vaccinated and boosted uh, seems to protect uh, most people against serious illness uh, or hospitalization or death. We don't have a lot of good numbers on that point yet because this is such a new variant. We just learned about it the last week of uh, November. Uh, but uh, it, to the best of our knowledge, from what we've seen in other countries and what we're seeing right now, uh, vaccination remains the single most important tool we have to prevent serious illness or, or death. Um, we are seeing spikes in our hospitalizations right now. We yesterday had over 1,100 hospitalizations. We were down around 300 uh, just about two weeks ago, a little over two weeks ago. So we've increased threefold, almost fourfold in the past two weeks in terms of the number of people who are hospitalized. That's normally a very manageable number. Uh, 1,100 inpatients is a lot of people, uh, but you know it, it's a third of, of where we've been at, at some points during the pandemic. Uh, although I will say flu season is also going on, hospitals are dealing with that, and hospitals are dealing with unprecedented numbers of infected healthcare workers right now, either infected or in some cases just exposed. Uh, so it, it is creating some difficulty for our hospitals simply because they have uh, many of their uh, healthcare workers who, who are just not able to work right now because of, uh, because of the infectiousness of, of Omicron. Um, it's a very, uh, very challenging situation. We have seen some data from the UK and, and others that other places that you've probably read about uh, that suggests that Omicron is, is not causes somewhat less serious illness overall than the Delta variant. That we, we think that's probably true. That certainly would be good news if that turns out to be the case. Uh, the UK study that, that I just mentioned showed that it caused death about half as often uh, as the Delta variant, so that would be terrific. 
Uh, here in Alabama, our experience with Delta was that about 2% of all people died uh, who, who were infected with that. Uh, if Omicron, if it is shown to be that, for example, maybe only 1% of people die with Omicron, that's still 10 times the rate of what we see uh, people with influenza uh, dying from. Uh, it's still, you know, tenfold more dangerous than influenza. Uh, and even if it's half as, uh, half as deadly, uh, you know, if you have a variant that infects twice as many people, you can see your numbers turn out to be the same. You still have the same issues with, with uh, a surge affecting your hospitals and numbers of people getting sick uh, or dying. We certainly hope that it is uh, less serious overall, and, and maybe that'll prove to be true at some point. I want to mention um, our, um, well, oh, finally I'll just say, we, we think probably most of the variants that are circulating now are Omicron. It's really difficult to prove that at the moment, just given the, the relatively low amount of, of genomic sequencing that's going on. Uh, we do have several places doing sequencing. Our state lab is doing it. Several other uh, labs in the state are doing it. Several national labs accept samples and, and, and do that in Alabama, as well as CDC continuing to do their sequencing. So we do have a lot of data points, but overall the numbers are still kind of small, given that Omicron has only been identified just about five weeks ago. Um, but internationally, we've seen Omicron tends to replace uh, Delta pretty quickly. That certainly happened in South Africa. It, it's almost happened in the UK. We are seeing in the northeastern U.S. and Omicron has become the predominant variant pretty quickly. So we believe, just given this sudden surge, I including breakthrough cases that are happening, that we probably have a different variant out there. So certainly Omicron is the, is the likely candidate, and we think most of the cases we're seeing now are Omicron. We'll have enough data to say that uh, in the next two or three weeks, I think. Let me mention vaccinations again. That continues to be our primary tool. Uh, we've uh, had about uh, 2.7 million people who received one or more doses. That puts us about 45th in the country. That's not nearly good enough. Uh, over 2.2 million people are completely vaccinated. That puts us ahead only of, of about three other states, uh, two or three other states. And again, that's not nearly as good as we would like. We are seeing uh, a lot of people who are getting booster doses, uh, almost 600,000 additional doses have been given, third doses have been given. Some of those may be uh, primary course third doses for immune compromised people, but, uh, but I think almost all those are, are booster doses. Uh, so we are seeing a good uptake among uh, booster doses, but again, we still have a long way to go to be where we want to be. Um, the best states in America, you know, have vaccinated over 85% of the people with at least one shot, uh, some approaching 90%, and we're, uh, you know, we're just over half of people have had uh, at least one shot in our state, so we have a, have a long way to go. I wanted to take a minute just to talk to you about the change in uh, CDC quarantine and isolation guidance that, that's come out uh, sort of in dribs and drabs over the past two or three weeks. It's actually been really confusing to a lot of people. We've had a lot of questions asked about it, and we've had questions, in fact, that we haven't been able to answer because we're still awaiting uh, guidance in some cases. But uh, generally speaking, um, what CDC has said is that people who have tested positive uh, for COVID who are getting better uh, and don't have fever or who don't have any symptoms at all by day five uh, can consider going back into public as long as they can wear a mask for an additional five days. There are uh, a number of uh, caveats around that. Um, it, it certainly is a good idea for those people to get tested, although CDC so far has stopped short of saying they have to have a test to come out of, of uh, isolation at five days. They've said specifically that this applies to the general population, but does not apply to schools. It does not apply to healthcare facilities. It does not apply to, to other congregate settings. They are working on additional specific guidance for those groups. Uh, the number one priority they have, they have told us, is getting out new school guidance. Uh, I, I know many schools have uh, have called us about the fact that they've seen this five-day quarantine rule and think that that should apply to schools, and it does not. Uh, we have uh, tried to put out statements on our website uh, referring people to our, uh, to our toolkit, our, our school toolkit. Our guidance for schools has not changed. We uh, continue to recommend universal masking in K through 12 schools. Uh, we uh, are still uh, encouraging everyone to follow exactly the same guidance that we have been doing all along. Uh, nothing has changed with regard to what we're saying to schools. Uh, as soon as we 
get additional guidance from CDC, uh, we'll, uh, we'll certainly uh, review that and, and presumably adopt that as soon as we have the ability to do that. Um, let, let me just take a minute and recognize Dr. Uh, Karen Landers on the phone. I think, you're, Karen, you're on the phone. Did you have anything you wanted to add about the schools? Dr. Harris, uh, thank you. I had a moment to unmute the line. I, I would just really like to reaffirm what you had said, and that is that after the initial CDC media release about shortened isolation for the general public, ADPH specifically sat in on phone calls with multiple expert groups discussing this and clarifying that this guidance did not apply to the school setting. And the reason for that being is that obviously while all of us are exhausted from COVID and all of us want to make everything simpler, we must continue to take the strongest measures possible to protect our children and also protect those people who have dedicated their careers to taking care of children. Again, our educators, our educational staff. So just to remind that you know we're not certainly trying to lag behind on this, but we want more clarification and we want to do all we can to, again, protect our children, protect our educational system, and keep our children in school. So we're going to be watching very, very closely for additional guidance, combing the literature and awaiting further information regarding the questions we pose. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. I appreciate that. <coughs> um, We'll, uh, I'm sure there'll be questions about that. We'll, we'll uh, be glad to, to take those as well. Just a, a couple of other issues uh, that I wanted to bring up. Since we've had our last uh, press briefing uh, a couple of months ago, uh, there have been a lot of changes with regard to uh, monoclonal antibodies that are available for outpatient treatment, and now we actually have two new oral drugs that have uh, emergency use authorization as well. Uh, and I'll just really briefly mention those, but I'm very happy to go into more details about that if, if, if you like. Um, I, I think the, the point that we uh, are, are most interested in trying to communicate uh, to the public but also to providers is that given the fact that Omicron is becoming the most uh, dominant variant, may already be by far the most dominant variant, uh, we, we do have different changes in, in the monoclonal antibody regimens that we recommend. Uh, there is a, a, a Glaxo, uh, a GSK monoclonal antibody called Citrovimab and it is the one that retains activity against Omicron. Uh, the others that are on the market, the Regeneron product and the Eli Lilly product, uh, don't seem to be active against the Omicron variant. Uh, and so there, there was a brief pause a couple of weeks ago. HHS said that we're not even going to ship uh, the Lilly and uh, Regeneron products anymore because we don't think they're going to be effective. Um, there's, for whatever reason, uh, a lot of uh, discussion in Washington about that and so just last week HHS has said well the pause is over we'll be glad to ship them if anybody wants them uh, our recommendation is that unless you know what variant you're treating uh, in in most cases it, it really ought to be the Glaxo product that's being used because Omicron is the most um, dominant variant um, that, that's a real challenge for our providers because you really can't usually get that variant information back in a timely way if you have to send that specimen off to get it sequenced somewhere. It's just going to take several days and by then you're kind of out of the window for treatment. So it, it's really challenging for uh, providers to know what to do. Our recommendation is that, that you ought to use citrovimab if you can get it, but like we've said many times with many different aspects of this response, it's in very short supply. We don't have a lot of it. Uh, we're on an allocation just like every other state. I think uh, this coming week we're going to get um, a total of 420 doses of, of citrovimab. Remember, we're having five or six or seven thousand new cases per day, uh, and once a week we're getting, you know, 400 doses of this product. So uh, there's not nearly enough to go around. Based on the uh, amount that's actually been requested by providers, uh, I, th I think we've got about three percent of what people are requesting. Uh, our pharmacy team has done a terrific job of, of trying to fairly allocate that. We have that spread around the state. Uh, geographically, we have it in, in a lot of different communities and we follow how that's being utilized so that we know from week to week where we need to send that. Um, but there's just not enough to go around, which is a real, uh, real difficult problem. We also have, as you know, two new oral medications. 
Um, I'll, uh, again, be glad to go into detail if you'd like us to discuss those, but I'll just say briefly there's also not nearly enough to go around. We're getting a, a state allocation every couple of weeks of just a few hundred doses, uh, I think five or six hundred doses of uh, the most effective product, which is uh, uh, the uh, one made by Pfizer uh, called Paxlovid. Uh, and again, you know, we're having thousands of cases a day and just getting uh, a few hundred doses every couple of weeks. So that's a, that's a real challenging situation for us right now. Paxlovid and the, the other Merck oral medication are going to be uh, dispensed through Walmart at the moment, one of our federal uh, uh, pharmacy partners. Uh, we have worked with Walmart to make sure that they have it spread evenly all over the state. They have the, the ability to move it around if it's not being utilized. Uh, obviously, the, ultimately, this will be a normal prescription drug that's available in every pharmacy everywhere once it's FDA approved. Uh, but at, at this point, uh, given the um, the small numbers of, of drug available, that's the location that it can be uh, uh, dispensed from just with a prescription by a, by a provider. Um, I finally wanted to um, just mention testing. Testing, you know, has become a huge problem for us. It, you can see the, the sheer numbers uh, of people who are out there seeking tests, and these are people who are getting tested because they feel sick and they want to have a test done in a lot of cases. We do not have enough testing to go around. I don't think any state has enough testing to go around, but we're working very hard to address this. It is possible uh, still right now to get tested uh, every day in every county health department uh, in Alabama, maybe not all day long every day, uh, but there is some testing available every day, just like there's vaccinations available every day in every county health department uh, around the state. Um, we are working with uh, some of the private uh, vendors that we had worked with previously just to see if we can get additional testing sites set up again. You, you may remember we, we did that in several cases uh, back during the, the surge last summer, and we're trying to get those uh, to be uh, standing up again uh, as soon as we're able to do that. Um, I, I will tell you our hospitals have reported that they're seeing a, a demand of people who are just showing up to get, get tested and that is not the right place to go. Please do not go to your hospital just to get a COVID test. Go to your hospital if you are sick and you think you need hospital care. Obviously, that's where you want to go. But for a routine test, that is not the place to go. That is not the best way to do that. And it unfortunately um, consumes a lot of resources that hospitals uh, need to put elsewhere. Uh, so if you have other options, uh, please, uh, please go elsewhere. Please don't go to your emergency department to get that tested. So um, I know I kind of flew through a lot of that. I've got a lot of other data we can go over, but I, I think I'll just pause right here and I'd certainly be glad to uh, start answering questions. When do you think the coronavirus will become an endemic, like things like the cold and the flu, and what's the timeline for when we'll cross that bridge <coughs> into going back to normal, and do you think the Omicron variant will help us do that? Yeah, so I, I think it is endemic. And I mean, it's here. It, it seems like it's here to stay. It's going to be very difficult to imagine it ever completely disappearing. Um, I, I would caution people about um, linking it too closely with our experience with flu. Remember, I mean, this is, you know, even now, this is a disease that's probably at least 10 times as deadly as the flu. And, and until recently, we said 20 times as deadly as the flu. Uh, it was only, you know, a few months ago in our last surge that we had so many people in Alabama hospitals that from COVID that people with routine everyday broken legs and, and heart attacks had to go to other states to get care. So th th this is absolutely not the same as the flu. Um, at the same time, we may just have to accept that we're going to be dealing with it. Um, and that's exactly what we're trying to do. The way we deal with it is we protect our most vulnerable people, our seniors and our people with chronic health problems. We do what we can to limit the spread in the community by vaccinating everybody possible, and then we try to make sure our healthcare facilities are able to handle those surges when they come. So we're all ready to move on. We're all tired of this. Uh, nobody wants to keep talking about COVID. You know, certainly nobody in this building wants to hear that word ever again, uh, but we're, we're not out of the woods. And, you know, I just mentioned to you, we had 41 people die yesterday. Um, we don't have that with the flu. We don't have that with common colds. It, it's just not the same thing. Dr. Harris, this is David Preston with Family News Now, and I have a question that, uh, that's along those lines. Uh, seeing that uh, the COVID is probably here to stay, and it can go anywhere and everywhere it wants to go, including Antarctica, and there's seen, uh, news out of uh, France seems to indicate there's a new variant uh, that's been discovered there. Uh, 
Do you think as the state's top health officer that it's time to uh, move from a public health policy of, of hide from and eliminate the virus to mitigate and manage the virus, kind of like we do the flu, like you just mentioned? And if so, what policy changes from the, uh, from the, state, the state level do you think that we would see that were different from what we're doing right now? Um, thanks for that question. I, I mean, I, I think I would say a lot of the things that I just said. I mean, we're um, th this is not the flu, and, and it's a mistake to treat it that way or to think of it that way. You know, in terms of having a disease that we always have to deal with, uh, I guess that's the sense in maybe what you're saying. We, we should think of it like the flu. Um, but, you know, we, we have a completely wide open uh, society at this point. We don't have health orders in place that are compelling people to do anything. Um, you know, Alabamians are making their choices to live any way they want, and I'm not sure what other policy changes could make things more normal for people. You know, the reason things aren't normal is that we have thousands of people getting sick every day, and we have dozens of people dying. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't know what policy change is going to improve that situation. What less restrictive policy change is going to improve that situation? Yeah, Kim. Nationally, we're seeing record numbers of children hospitalized, although that's still a very small percentage of infected children that end up in the hospital. Is there any indication that children are more susceptible to Omicron, or is that a factor of the contagiousness? Oh, so we, we've got about 34, I think was a number today, uh, pediatric hospitalizations around the state out of 1,100. That, that's a little bit higher percentage than we were seeing before. You know, we had numbers in the 30s and 40s of kids back when we had 3,000 people in the hospital. So I, I would just say that's one data point. I'm not sure you can jump to any conclusions from that. I, I've seen, uh, you know, honestly not scientific reports, but national media reports saying, you know, some people think it, it tends to affect kids more often. And, and maybe it does. Clearly it, um, you know, the question is, does it affect kids more than adults? And I don't know if that's true. Clearly this infects everybody more than the previous things infected anybody, right? And so more kids are gonna get infected than previously. Um, also, you know, kids are still by and large uh, our largest unvaccinated group, and vaccination is the thing that seems to be, you know, most helpful in preventing infection. So, I, so I, I don't know, um, but it, it certainly could be the case. Yeah. What's your recommendation for state lawmakers and the general public about, because we have an upcoming session coming up, uh, what's your recommendation as far as access in the state house? Yeah, we, we actually have some calls with, with uh, the leadership later this week to talk about that. You know, it, it's a difficult situation. You know, our legislators are, you know, compelled by law to assemble, and they have to uh, keep the business of the state running, and there's no question that, that their duties, you know, can't just be stopped or put off. Uh, in terms of, of having people there, our, our guidance is going to be the same as it was for the previous session. We need people to do everything possible uh, to uh, keep people as safe as possible. Um, whether you know visitors can come into the building or not, honestly, is a is a uh, legal decision. You know, it's not a public health decision. Um, you know, can you legally keep people out of the you know public space when the legislature is in session? I, I don't know the answer to that, but our guidance is the same. You know, we know that this disease spreads when you have lots of people packed close together, unmasked indoors, particularly if they're unvaccinated. So, anything you can do to mitigate any of those factors is the way that you keep people safe. Yeah, Mike. You mentioned the severe shortage of the monoclonal, monoclonal antibodies that are effective with Omicron and the two oral medications, both not nearly enough as we need. What's the long-term outlook for that? And yeah. in the meantime, are there any other treatments that are helpful for people after they are diagnosed? The, those, are the, those are the ones that we have the best evidence for, and the production of all of those is ramping up. And you know, it's going to inc only going to increase. We expect in a few weeks we'll have a lot more of it, just like we saw with the supply of vaccine, or like we saw with the supply of test kits, or whatever. It just takes a while to ramp up the full pr full production. You know, what we hope is that by the time we get lots of supply out there, that we don't have a different variant that those are now rendered ineffective for. And, and you know, you just don't know how to um, just don't know how to predict that. But but hopefully that'll be the case. Um, those are definitely the most effective things that we have. Kind of following up on that, um, people are having trouble finding tests. I know this isn't unique to Alabama. This is something that's going on all across the nation. But what's the timeline for getting those testing sites up that you mentioned, and how can we prevent this, um, you know, and ensure that testing is readily available when people need it? 
and yeah. not when it's too late. No, no question that we don't have enough tests. One thing that we're, um, I'll say this first, one thing that we're, you know, sort of looking towards is what the federal government, you know, recently announced. They expect to have, I think the number was uh, several hundred million, you see I wrote it down, 500 million over-the-counter tests within the next month or so, they've said, that'll be available to people free of charge, and it's not clear if we're going to be in charge of shipping those out or if others are going to be uh, shipping those out. Uh, but certainly th there'll be a you know, in the, uh, a greatly increased number of uh, tests that are available to people through that aspect. In terms of what we're doing, we're working on it as fast as possible. I don't know what the timeline is, but we, we are already having, you know, meetings and phone calls with these vendors who do this, and they're people that we've worked with before, and so we hope that we can get things up and going very quickly. We do have federal money that'll help uh, to, to defray the cost of that, so, so money's not a... Uh, not a limiting step right now, but but hopefully as soon as possible. Yeah, let me go to the phone there. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, hey, thank you. This is Morgan with Fox 6 in Birmingham. Along the lines of the federal announcement, the president said, I guess a couple weeks ago now, that states would be getting more in terms of additional staffing, and then also FEMA might be setting up more testing sites. Has Alabama heard specifically anything from that extra relief for hospital workers right now? Uh, I, I would say, I, not to my knowledge, I, I have not heard that. Uh, I, I, I've heard what you are referring to, but I have not heard any specifics on that. Um, th there is, you know, th the ability, again, to access some FEMA dollars for testing, and we have talked to them about doing that as well. Th those are not, w when, we, when you go that route, those are not quick processes. Those are actually really slow processes, and it, it takes a, uh, a long time to, to to go through the steps of doing that. So we certainly have that as an option um, if we need to do that. One more question for you. Um, just going back to the CDC guidance with the five days for everyone else, um, but then I think the CDC is recommending seven days if a healthcare worker is asymptomatic after getting tested. Can you explain the, the difference between why a healthcare worker should stay for seven days but everyone else in the community besides school? Um, it's five days. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, see, I have that here somewhere. I was going to try to refer to it. Um, yeah, so, so what CDC's guidance about healthcare facilities said, it, it actually, you know, makes a difference whether people are vaccinated and boosted or, you know, not, either, you know, incompletely vaccinated or unvaccinated. And it has to do also with uh, whether the, the hospital is in a particular crisis situation or are they just under conventional uh, conditions where, you know, staffing is okay and numbers are manageable, or is it, you know, this intermediate category they call contingency staffing issues, or is it a true crisis situation? So there's a lot of variables there. Um, I, it, because hospitals contain our most vulnerable people, uh, I, I think the CDC was, was unwilling to go to five days uh, on healthcare workers who are going to be working in these facilities where people are already ill to begin with, you know, obviously as a hospitalized patient they, you know, are going to be more vulnerable than people uh, on average. I, I will tell you that CDC's guidance, it, it does allow for seven days with a test or it does allow for other things, but uh, it doesn't prefer that. You know, it actually still prefers 10 days. That's the, you know, for people who are vaccinated and boosted, um, it, it still prefers uh, people go home for 10 days, just like we have always said. But it just understands the reality of the situation we're in. You know, under crisis situations, you know, which I, I don't think we've ever experienced this definition of crisis. It just says that even if people are infected, they can come to work as normal. Well, you know, we, we've not been to that point in America yet so far, you know, thank goodness. But that was one of the uh, things that they actually put into print, you know, just in case that situation should arise. So, um, again, they prefer uh, to keep healthcare workers out longer simply because of the population they're taking care of, but they just understand in some cases that might not be possible. Oh, in, in the toolkit on which part, on quarantine and isolation guidelines, or? Yes, on the 10-day uh, quarantine time. Yeah, it, it, it's our guidance based on the best public health guidance that we have from CDC. Um, you know, we, we don't have the ability to enforce it, but we work, 
you know, you know very closely with schools and try to make them understand, uh, you know, what the guidance is and why we're doing that. You know, ultimately, uh, a lot of these decisions are made by local school boards. That seems to be what Alabama communities think they want to do. Uh, and we can't always, you know, ensure that they're following everything that, that we would recommend. Um, we, you know, I think that's unfortunate, and we certainly uh, hope they will and try to educate them better to understand the, the medical reasons that we're making the recommendations that we have. Uh, but ultimately, they're going to make those decisions locally. from the Wall Street Journal. I was wondering how many courses of treatment of each antiviral Alabama has received so far. And then to just follow up on what you asked, said earlier, is, is Walmart the only lo location to receive any of the COVID antivirals so far? Yes. Uh, to answer your second question, yes. At, at the moment, Walmart's the only one who has received them so far. You know, in, in our state, uh, you know, if you're not familiar, that that's actually a... a you know, the one facility that's kind of omnipresent in Alabama, and we have them in a lot of rural communities, and we have them, you know, spaced everywhere. And so we identified them as one of our federal pharmacy partners who uh, agreed that they would work with us to make sure we were targeting our highest SVI counties, you know, getting them to our most vulnerable populations, but also had the infrastructure that would let them move them around at our request if we were seeing low utilization in one place or, or uh, you know, or another place. In terms of the total numbers, let me see if uh, I think I have that information in the room here. Just one second. So, Dr. Harris, and I mean, correct me, you have 780 courses of the Pfizer. Merck's okay. still not in here. Yeah. Okay. We, so, so far, we have 780 uh, courses of Paxlovid, the Pfizer product. Uh, the uh, Molnupiravir, the Merck product, has not arrived yet in Alabama. Do, do we know what we're going to get, what our allocation is going to be? It's just over, what, 3,000? It's over 3,000. Just over 3,000. Uh, we, we're, we're told that we're going to be allocated just over 3,000 courses, but we have yet to receive any of them. Thank you. Dr. Garrett, do you know how many of the 780 doses have been prescribed to people? Uh, no, I, I don't have that information. They are required to report their usage uh, to HHS, so we'll, we'll eventually have access to that, but I don't know that to this point. I, I can just tell you anecdotally, I've had a number of calls from Alabama providers who you know, said they use the, you know, 20 doses in their local store in one day and, and are completely out. So uh, I, I'd say most of them, but I don't know the exact number. Yeah. Okay. Given the, the high rate of infections and the limited supply of treatment, are there triage guidelines in place of who should go to the first of the line? Yeah, so, so we, we spent a lot of time trying to determine how we would, we would issue that guidance, and ultimately we have uh, just used the language in the EUA to guide providers, which is that it needs to go to people who are vulnerable to serious illness or, you know, have, you know, comorbidities or, or uh, older age. Uh, we have, you know, tried not to be too prescriptive otherwise, and that, that leaves a lot of flexibility for the provider to do that. So these are not for every person. They're not for, you know, uh, people who are young and healthy and otherwise likely to do well. But they're for people who are seniors who have chronic health problems. Uh, you know, frankly, in Alabama, that's a lot of people, um, as you know. Uh, but 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 beyond the language in the EUA, we've not been prescriptive about that. Dr. Harris Darwin, Singleton with NBC 15 in Mobile. We're seeing right now a 44.7 percent positivity rate in Mobile County, which is on the higher end of the state. Do you have any guess as to why it's so much more high down here than maybe in some other parts of the state? Uh, I no, I, I I don't know in particular. I, I would say that every you know every single county in the state is you know beyond the threshold for being a high transmission county, and uh, you know I, I would I don't know that there's uh, practically speaking much difference between you know 37 percent statewide and 44 percent in your county. You know I mean those those are those are all bad. Uh, you know no matter what degrees of difference there may be there. Um, so I I don't know. Uh, you know clearly we. Um, we are counting only people that have um, these uh, PCR tests, which are done by laboratories and repu reported to public health. And so it may be that you just have uh, differences in access to that kind of testing, you know, that maybe another county, you know, people are relying on home antigen tests or something. I, I, I don't know for sure, but um, I, I would say um, n none of those numbers are very good. And so. 
forgive me if I missed this, the, the last I heard from the hospital association, it was about 32% of patients they have data on who are vaccinated. Um, are we getting booster data on hospitalized patients? Do you know what that is? We, we don't have it yet. Um, we've asked them to, to, to try to start collecting that, so we're working on that. But about two-thirds of the hospitalized patients, as you said, are, are unvaccinated. About a third are vaccinated. Um, that's kind of consistent with what other people are uh, reporting with regards to um, um, to Omicron. It does cause breakthrough infections. You know, when, I guess one way to um, think of that in sort of really rough terms is about half the state's vaccinated, about half the state's not vaccinated, and yet the unvaccinated people are two-thirds of our hospitalized patients. I mean, it, it clearly um, being vaccinated protects you against hospitalization, uh, whether the Hopefully we'll have the booster information soon, but we just don't have it yet.